first of all, I just want to say I'm really grateful to uh, to be here. I'll get into some of my background here in a minute, which will help it explain why. But a little foreshadowing will be a little bit. So I was a student here 30 years ago, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the experience. But so I'm giving, oh, I guess I'll give a couple disclaimers here. My PowerPoint is admittedly kind of half-assed because I, so I used to be a faculty member at Westminster and I tended to downgrade students that, that overdid PowerPoint and relied on it. So I try to be consistent with my teaching methodology from the past. And I might say a bad word or two. So do I have your permission to do that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's uh it's done for emphasis, because hopefully you'll remember it. I don't give a lot of advice. I don't really feel like I'm in a position to, but when I do, I want it to be memorable. So sometimes utilizing a powerful word might, might help you remember it. So here's what I'm gonna go through. I'll give you some of my background and, and story about me, and then I'll, I'm going to tell you some truth behind some of the lies that you get told all the time, especially when you're a student, you get told this stuff. I'm going to pass on one of the most important pieces of advice I ever got, and that's the importance of fuck you money. And most of you probably don't have it now, but you can get it and then what you, and how important it is in your life. Something else, so I, I presume most of you grew up here in this, in this town, right? Okay or in the area, and if not, you're, well, at least you, you're here right now. And I'm gonna talk about small Lake City and why we sometimes refer to our city as that and the value and the of your network. I'll give a couple reflections and enough for Q&A. So my hope here is uh, to, one thing I promise, I will finish on time. The other objective I typically have when I present is to not be boring way easier for me to accomplish the first one than the second, but I'm going to try to do both. So here, I'll just, this is a quick, just basic, like what I do professionally right now. So my name is Dr. Mike Bills. I only throw out the doctor piece because I'm in a, yes, I have a PhD, but I, people that make you call them doctor, especially if it's outside of academia, there's a technical term for people to do that. And it's, they're assholes, and I'm not one of them. But since I'm in a higher ed institution, they typically like you to do that. So that's the only time I'm just Mike. I live in Salt Lake City. I've been married uh, for 27 years. I have two children. They're 19 and 16. Uh, they are both uh, elite big mountain skiers. My son Dylan is at Snowbird right now, competing in a free ride world tour qualifier. I always hope. Be, be safe, don't get hurt, uh, land on your feet, get a score, and anything else is a bonus. So my family's up at Snowbird right now. With that, my daughter's also one of the top big mountain skiers in North America. She's competing in the North American Championships in uh, Kicking Horse in British Columbia in a couple weeks. I am the president of Atlas RTX. The RTX in that name stands for uh, Real-Time Experience. We are uh, one of the leading providers of conversational artificial intelligence, digital assistants. You might know them as chatbots. We choose digital assistant because it distinguishes us from the dumb chatbots, and there are many of them. And so we support complex uh, customer journeys for considered purchases. So I'll show you a slide that just has a bunch of the uh, companies with whom we work, and that'll kind of that'll help explain what a complex considered purchases. I'm also a, a member of the Board of Trustees of Westminster College, which on which I served for 16 years. So I've had a, a window into higher education uh, for a long time. Uh, I, for, a, for a while, I taught uh, finance at Westminster quite a while ago. And I had an epiphany after doing it for two years that I was neither good at it, nor did I like it. So I stopped doing it. <laughs> I admire those that do it well, because it's hard. Seriously, teaching is really hard. I am a ski bum. So actually, there's, there is an embellishment here. 
I was working on this last night. I thought I was going to have time to go skiing. I didn't, so I've only skied 102 days thus far. But by the end of today, it should be it should be 103. I do that mostly backcountry skiing, so I can do it really early in the morning before work or really late. I don't need no stinking chairlift. I just need some skins on my skis and a headlamp and some fitness. Where's your go-to? Uh, Mike, so when I'm backcountry skiing, I typically, so my office is in Kimball Junction. So right as you get off the freeway in Park City, so there's skiing in Summit Park. So right at the top of Parley's, there's skiing in Lambs Canyon. There's ski, and once Deer Valley closes, then I can start skinning up Deer Valley and skiing down the daily shoots. Yeah. When I ski the resorts, I ski out in Snowbird primarily. And just a fun fact, so we're in the Gail, Gail Miller School of Business. Gail Miller threw me out of her house in 1988 because I went to high school with, with her, uh, one of her kids. They had an event over there, my friends and I, anyway, we started a fight and Gail threw us out of the house. Uh, <laughs> she's a business lady. That's right. was named after her. <laughs> so this is just a quick about our business. Uh, these are some of the clients with whom we work. And so, um, again, I mentioned we do conversational artificial intelligence, digital, and so what, which is a fan. So we are a software as a service company. We are headquartered in Park City. Uh, we're still a pretty small team. We're around 37 people. We were purchased by a big public company four months ago, but we're staying as an independent unit. <clears throat> so that was a cool success for us. We're now adjusting to, uh, to what life is like as, as a business unit within a big, large $2.2 billion company. But these are organizations that we work with. So we happen to dominate the home building space. So when it comes time for you to buy a home, you'll go to one of these big home builder websites and you'll see our chatbot on their website and you can ask it questions. You can search their inventory. You can uh, schedule an appointment. And once you do that, then we follow you with, uh, with artificial intelligent uh, text messaging afterward. And so what we try to do there is support the journey. And the reason we call it a considered purchase is this is the biggest investment most people make in their lives, which is buying a home. Uh, it's high stakes because when you buy a home, you've looked at a dozen homes. And so finding, making the decision of this one versus the other ones is consequential at zero sum. If I buy this house, I don't buy any of the other houses. And, and so all my dreams of what life would have been like in those houses will not come to fruition. So it's really complicated. And so having, but buyers now are used to doing things in a, a self-service way. Like who here has bought anything off Amazon, right? Pro, right? Is it, who here has returned anything on Amazon? And who here has talked to somebody at Amazon? Okay. So that gets rare. So it's, so what we've come to like is things that we can do in real time, 24 seven, whenever we want and do it ourselves. That's become the type of, of white glove surf. That's an old time term. You don't even know what that means. So that's become the premier level of service where I can do it myself. You can buy a Tesla online, not have to talk to anybody. So that's the space that we're playing in. So what's the second big invest, biggest investment most people make in their lives? That's higher education. It has a similar customer journey where you'll explore on the website and then the institutions want you to come and do a tour. After you've done the tour and apply and get admitted, you still got all these other choices. So again, we can follow with smart text messaging and I'm not gonna belabor the business that much. I just thought you might wanna know what this guy does for a living right now. Oh, and then we have a couple, these are some rental real estate uh, uh, companies. We also do some stuff in tech tours and the brands. These are experiments, and we're just trying to figure out if these are markets for us to be in where we've got some pilots. But in these two verticals, we do a lot of business, and in home building, we dominate that space. So I'll tell you a little bit about me. It's my favorite subject to talk about me, so I appreciate you guys allowing me to do this. Um, so I was born and raised in Salt Lake City. So I grew up just uh, west of Liberty Park. And then when I was 11, my family moved out to Sandy. I was a distinguished high school student because I got into a ton of trouble. Thus, the reason I have, I accumulated credits from four different high schools. 
the plurality of my credits were at Alta High School. So when I think of if somebody asks me where I went to high school, I usually just short circuit. I went to Alta, um, but I got credits from, I got tossed in a drug rehab when I was in 11th grade. So I went to school for the most part in 11th grade there. I got some credits, I think from Murray High and Jordan as a result of that. And then um, Alta High School did not want me to come back. So I did my senior year at West Jordan High School and that's where I graduated, which led me here to Salt Lake Community College. So when you're a student of some ill repute as, as it were, my academic preparation was less than stellar. And so I had, although I had decent ACT scores, I had bad grades and I needed an open access institution, which is what community college is. Community college happens to be this wonderful American invention. It's, we, these types of schools don't exist outside the United States by and large. And so I found a home here at Salt Lake Community College. So I found some professors to help me with structure where I could learn study skills, I also learned how to write, which is one of the most important skills that, that has served me professionally, even though I'm not a professional writer. But Salt Lake Community College was amazing for me. I got exposed to things like the humanities. I took survey of music, survey of art, survey of theater, basically anything that said survey in front of it, it got my attention because it meant I could get exposure to it and see if I was interested. But I was able to do a lot of discovery here. And I'm so grateful that there was a place where I could come with my particular level of preparation, which was not great, and evolve and grow and feel at home. One of the other things that I loved about Salt Lake Community College is that I met people that were different from me. I lived in a pretty white bread world uh, and it was cool to meet people from different backgrounds. So, and as a board member of Westminster, I am our strongest advocate for accommodating transfer students uh, because <laughs> they help that campus change and become diversified. Uh, and by the way, there's an awesome business case for uh, transfer students. Uh, transfer students graduate at a much higher rate than incoming freshmen at all four-year universities. So if, I'm not here to pitch for Westminster College, but um, if you haven't thought about it, please do. And if you think it's too expensive, it's not. It's going to cost the same as it would if you were at the U, which is where most transfer students from here end up going. All right, enough with my pitch about that. So is that where you got your bachelor's? Or yeah. Okay. So here's another fun fact about me. So as this not uh, prepared student, um, I also, so there's probably many of you here that you're the first in your family to go to college. Um, so I was a first generation student. My parents weren't particularly, education wasn't a priority. And so, and we also didn't have much money. So um, I was on my own. So as soon as I was uh, done with high school, it was kind of like, you know, good luck, God bless my mm -hmm. get out and figure it out for yourself. So I had to prioritize work uh, over school. I had to fit school around work and I happened to luck into a job as a 18 year old kid. So my, I needed a full-time job. The criteria had full-time that was at night so I could go to school during the day. And so I got this job at a company. This, this is going to blow your mind. It was called Feature Films for Families and we sold family-oriented entertainment on um, VHS, starting on VHS. I, like my kids, I use those when my kids are little. Yeah, all right. So there are these things called VHS tapes. And you put them in this big box and they would play movies. You may have seen them or heard about them. Then there were DVDs that we went to later. You've probably seen those. And so I would sell these from 3 p.m. till 11 p.m over the phone so i'd interrupt people at dinner and sell them these movies and this is such i don't mean to boast it's a really backhanded boast though i've never been as good at anything as i was at selling those g-rated movies over the phone 
So I did. I peaked as an 18-year-old telemarketer. And so my life at that time was going to school here and selling videos. However, this peaking as an 18-year-old telemarketer turned out to be this ridiculously meaningful thing that for the rest of my life, because that company, Feature Films for Families, at that point was about 100 people. So it was about like five staff people, a couple of managers of the call center, and then a bunch of call center people that just turned over like every couple of weeks. So if you stuck around for a month, you were a veteran. Six months later, you were a sage that everybody would look to for advice. And so I had success there and I kept getting promoted and the company took off. And so this turned out to be the launching path for my career. Was that just the um, church DVDs or did they do a lot of other ones? So we were not affiliated with the oh. with any religion. It oh, was because we were in Utah, but oh, okay. people tended to think that. So oh. no, so we- There was we, other ones that were- Correct. Which, do you know which, who they were? I can't there remember. There was uh, Living That's, Scriptures. That's there what were, I thought you were um, about. Yeah, okay. so that was, that was not us. So we were you know, non-denominational, mm -hmm. but we sold to really, really conservative uh, families. People that would think like Disney was, uh, was a bridge too far. So, in this four-year gap from being an 18-year-old telemarketing phenom, um, the company grew to, we had about a thousand employees, we were probably doing about $60 million a year in revenue, and I had ascended to become the chief information officer there by the age of 22, so it was amazing, but I, so I had to put a big pause on going to school because I was working about a hundred hours a week at the time and I freaking loved it. It was the best thing in the world. I'd never been so good at anything. I, I didn't want to do anything but work. And that really, I mean, it, that paid off. It didn't pay off in money at first, but because again, I was just 22 and all my peers were like, this is insane that this kid, he shouldn't be in this position, but I just kept my head down, worked hard, and the rewards came. What was their um, revenue or their their business worth? So we were doing about sixty million dollars a year. Oh wow, that's that. a lot back then. I mean, ten back then. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I got. I ended up getting married at twenty three years old because when I had this big serious job, I thought I was like fully formed and totally mature, which is ridiculously laughable in retrospect. My wife was a year ahead of me, uh, so she seemed old at 24. Or so anyway, the two of us got married, and you know, and we grew up here in Utah. So even though we weren't uh, weren't of the predominant faith, we were still influenced by all those that, that tend to do things pretty young. So this seemed normal to us. And again, in retrospect, it's amazing that we are still together. Like we did, because you're not you're not fully formed. I mean, I know many of you think you are, but but you'll you're going to be really different in a, in the future. The brain isn't fully developed until you're 25 or 26. Oh. With the decision-making skills. About I, I keep uh, thinking that mine's not. But it works right. for you guys. So this is an important thing. So anyway, so I went back to school and finished uh, right before my 29th birthday. And it's, it's really interesting when I did this because my dad, again, education wasn't a huge priority in our family. My dad was wondering, why are you doing that? Because I was making fantastic money at, at feature films at that point. So my dad's comment to me was, why are you going to go back to school and take classes for professors where you make way more money than they do? And there's a theme in throughout. My dad mostly gave me bad advice. And that was, that was bad advice. So what were the motivators for why I went back to finish school, even though I had a high six-figure job? So one is I was ashamed that I didn't have on my resume the line item for where I had graduated from college. Everybody else did, but I didn't. I tried to rationalize that at times when I was cocky by like, I'm so smart, I didn't need to go to school like all these hacks. But there was a practical part of me that knew that if, let's say, something happened to that company, and by the way, something did, and I'll get to that later, uh, and I don't have this job anymore, 
I realized it's going to be harder for me to go get this uh, a job like this. I'm young. I don't have an education. I worked at one company. That's not an awesome profile. And so I needed to do this. And by the way, going to school as an adult when you're when you're married and you got a full time job is a bitch. This was ridiculously hard. I have all it was was hard work. I don't have relationships from it. I don't look back on my on those days with nostalgia. It was just I needed to do it to check a box. I did become president of Feature Films for Families. So shortly thereafter which gave me some cool stuff. Like I, I got to be on the cover of Utah Business Magazine when they did their first edition of uh, 40 Under 40. And again, this, <laughs> there was, so during some of this stage, I thought for sure I wanted to stay here. Uh, I thought this was the greatest job for somebody my age, short of being the shortstop of the Kansas City Royals, uh, which is my favorite baseball team. Um, so I, at this point, I really thought I'd stay there forever. But I wanted to keep going uh, and doing more school. So one of the things when you're back then, when you're trying to do an undergraduate degree as a non-traditional student um, and work full time, your options are limited. My options were a lot more. Uh, I have more options once I did this because getting an MBA, a lot of MBAs are geared towards working adults. So I chose, uh, went back to Westminster to do my MBA. I finished when I was 31. I also became a father around this time. And during this time, by being in this MBA program with a bunch of other working professionals doing all kinds of things, I decided I wanted to do other things. I didn't know exactly what those were, but I decided I had an itch to scratch, which is what I wanted to, I wanted to own my own business. So through the help of one of my professors in, uh, in business school, so I wanted to own my own business, but I didn't think of myself as an inventor. And I had conflated inventors and entrepreneurs. And my professor, his name's Dick Fontaine, he's still one of my dearest friends. He helped me understand that that's not what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship is, you know, having ideas, having a certain look at something, maybe being it, maybe inventing, maybe improving, but more importantly, acting. And so what he helped me do is establish some criteria around buying a business. And so I didn't have any money. I'd had a good salary, but it's not like I'd accumulated a ton of money. And so he helped me establish some criteria to buy a business. I ended up buying this business, HK Truck Equipment. They put stuff on trucks like cranes, et cetera, that do work and they sell. So this business was badly broken. My partner and I managed to turn this around and do great. We didn't realize how much luck we had though. And then we bought another the manufacturing the same stuff that we made. So like all the big snowplow trucks that you see around here, we manufactured all of that stuff, assembled it. So most of the dump trucks and construction trailers you'd see in the Intermountain West, we, uh, we did this. So that got us some other attention from Utah Business Magazine. We were the fast, one of the fastest companies, uh, fastest growing companies. And we ended up selling this to a strategic buyer which means some, we ended up selling it to a regional competitor. That's just a fancy term for strategic buyer is somebody that's not a financial buyer. Somebody like a private equity firm is a financial buyer. Well, I also increased the number of children I had by 100%. So we had our second, second child right around this time. And then I founded another company, which was related to the work I had done at Feature Films for Family. I mentioned being a, a gifted telemarketer. We took those gifts. And, and created some technology to make telemarketing a lot more efficient and effective. And so we, I ended up buying that technology from feature films and starting a company called Call Assistant where, we did, where people would outsource their call center efforts to us. I ultimately sold that business to Saren Capital. And then I co-founded a uh, company called ConnectSed which was an online student services platform. So doing like academic advising, financial aid, uh, ca uh, counseling. And my biggest customers were community colleges. 
The California Community College system was my biggest customer, but we, we 80 percent of our business came from community colleges. I died in uh, in 2017. I uh, when it, I experienced sudden cardiac arrest while working out on my bike trainer in my office. I got better, as you can see. <laughs> so, but this, How old were you? I was 44. Oh, wow. So this, um, I was diagnosed with a, a, um, a congenital heart defect called arrhythmic right ventricle dysplasia. You're gonna be tested on that. And usually it presents in your early 20s. It's typically diagnosed after you've died. Anyway, I, so this was like a one in 10 million chance for me to experience this. Usually it'll kill you in like within minutes because the electrical function of your heart goes crazy. Your heart's going, my heart was going at like 265 beats a minute when the, when the paramedics got there, which is, means there's no blood that's pumping, but your heart's just fluttering. That's why you die so fast. So anyway, I was in that state for 42 minutes. So it's just amazing that the reason I mentioned this is because like, I'm in bonus time now. Uh, and I'm really grateful. Stuff that used to bother me doesn't bother me now because I'm, a, you know, I'm a bonus time. And I don't tend to celebrate my normal birthday anymore. So I turned, I turned chronologically 50 back in July. But really, I'm six. I'm just a toddler because I died and got, and got better. So Did six you years get a ago. transplant? I have a, you might be able to see it. I have a, oh, uh, I see it, yeah. a def, so I have a defibrillator. So if all of a sudden I slump over and boom, get blasted, that's what happened. It, it's, it's highly unlikely though. So one of the other things I did um, when you have a new perspective is I went back to school again um, as sort of a midlife crisis and got, obtained a PhD in leadership and change. My dissertation was on small private colleges that flirt with, out of, with going out of business and then manage to turn themselves around. Some of the most fun, satisfying stuff I've ever done in my life. I would encourage anybody going through a midlife crisis to do that rather than go get a younger girlfriend, buy a sports car. <laughs> this way less expensive, much more productive, and will last a lot longer. Where, where did you get your PhD? So I did that at Antioch University. So Antioch is in Yellow Springs, Ohio. It's a kind of a hippie institution. It's famous for being one of the, the first colleges in the United States to admit black students. And it was founded by Horace Mann, famous educator. Let's see, the most, his famous quote is, be ashamed to die until you've won some victory for humanity. So the super transformational experience. I had 29 students in my cohort. I was the only white male. Um, there were only three men in my cohort. Uh, and so being this white dude from Utah in that program with these people. So I learned a lot of stuff. I'm really proud of the work I did, but I was transformed by being a part of that cohort or some of my dearest friends. And anyway, it's- So, so you actually, you did do it online. You actually moved there. I didn't move there. So it was a, it was a, most of the PhD you do on your own anyway. Oh. Um, so we had have, we have four week-long residencies throughout the year, and they were just intense as hell. So we did part in person and then the stuff that we would do on our own. Oh, so, but you lived in Utah or Ohio? Oh, I lived in Utah. And okay. so we would do those. Um, so we would just you know, rent a house or something for- Oh, so you would travel back to work. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. So anyway, that's just the quick stuff about me, how I got here. I am, and again, I'm now president of Atlas, and I mentioned that we, that we sold to Max. So now let me tell you some truth behind the lies. Some of what I just showed you will actually illustrate some of these points. So college students get told a lot of stuff by old people like me, and a lot of it is bullshit. A lot of it is people reflecting back on their own days through the, the gauzy haze of nostalgia, which, and then they make stuff up about what, what they actually did to get there. So I'm going to start with one of these LinkedIn profiles and bios. You guys probably see when you see those, like that's the whole story. Like if you go and look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll go, damn, that's impressive. But the reality is they're whitewashed, they're sanitized, and they're embellished. 
So my LinkedIn profile and what I just went through with you omitted so much of the of what really happened. So the true story of me is way more non-linear than I just represented. So I went through this as if it was just this where maybe it looked intentional and maybe it looked like it was serial, just one thing after another. It wasn't. Yes. Okay, so yeah, yeah. it's incredible what you're telling us. Like, I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, I would like to ask you about um, like, how was like your like so social life when you were like in high school? Because like you said that you were like in trouble a lot, and you know like I would like to know like then you had like a lot of success, right? How 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 was like your social life? So you know? as a high school student, so I um, I was really good at two sports, so I was really good at wrestling and baseball. And so as a ninth grade kid, I played varsity at both of those, which, which then had me hanging out with a bunch of older kids. And I wanted to be cool with those older kids, just like they were. And so what were they doing? Drinking, smoking pot, getting in trouble. And, and I, when I do something, I tend to jump in all the way. So if I was going to get in and we were going to be drinking and smoking pot, it was like, let's do this right. Uh, so, I, so I was kind of a jock. And then also, cut, I was the guy that could also sell you weed. Uh, so uh, as a high school student, I didn't prioritize or try at school at all. Uh, the easiest path you could take is exactly what I was looking for. So, uh, so do you think like maybe that kind of like what experience with people may, maybe help you to kind of like have more social skills and kind of like sell better like the things? Well, I certainly had social skills. So. I was extroverted and I had lots of friends and I was you know, popular as it were because high school kids tend to value really superficial stuff. They yeah. think the jock is cool and they think the guy that's selling them weed is cool mm -hmm. and less so the person who is just killing it in school. And so I benefited from, at least socially, from sort of the, the perverse values that teenage kids happen to have. So I had a ton of, even, and again, even though I went to different high schools, I had a ridiculous amount of fun because when I came from Alta to West Jordan, because I'd been an athlete, I knew a lot of the guy, I knew the baseball players and the wrestlers over at, at West Jordan, but everybody also knew that's the rehab guy. I bet he's fun to party with. And so I, all of a sudden it was just like, Oh, all right, great. Where, you know, where are the parties? So that was, uh, yeah, that was high school for me. That sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would not. I sure as hell didn't want my, like my son sense. repeating the same thing. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you probably had like pre-existing car issues or your heart probably just like. I did. So you're, I was born with this. Um, the, ben, the only benefit I had, so it's progressive. It gets worse. Um, it just, for me, it's going a lot, a lot more slowly than. So. Um, I would, so I actually had heart surgery back in 2019 and a few times before then. One of the things I did, I went on a keto diet because I saw myself getting like 280 pounds. And I was like, I do not want to be here. If I hit her or something, I'm just going to get bigger. And so I just went on a keto diet. And like the next time I saw my cardiologist, which was like six months after, he was like, holy cow, there was damage to your heart that's no longer there. Wow. Yeah. And I lost like a hundred pounds by that point. Good for you. I wish that stuff would work for yes. So did you say you were born with it, but you didn't know till I didn't know till I almost got that problem. That's right. right. Yep. And you said that about 22. Oh, if you're born with it, it normally starts at 22. Yeah. But you're on 42. Okay. Yep. So as I mentioned, that story I just gave you is not as linear as is. It's not as clean. There's a lot of different stuff. And there's a lot of bad shit that I skipped over. And that is not just in my story and my bio and my LinkedIn profile. So when you find yourself getting intimidated or impressed by the people out there who are ostensibly impressive, there's a lot more to the story. It's just that they don't want to tell you. The exits, so the places where we sold the business, as I put them on that list and as they show up on my LinkedIn profile, they look way more significant than they actually are. So it is a real achievement to start a business and sell it or to buy a business and sell it. Like any, any jackass can buy a business. It's really hard to then to sell it. So I succeeded in that. 
But one thing I didn't mention with H&K and Tesco Williamson, so we, we got up to, we had a couple hundred employees. We were doing about 30 million a year in revenue. Well, that was during the Great Recession. We manufactured construction equipment. And in 2008, the, the financial market collapsed and demand for construction equipment went to zero. And so my partner and I were lucky that we didn't go personal, personally bankrupt. We escaped sort of with the skin of our teeth and so we sold the business and it was in distress. So it looked cool and I can talk about it with a straight face, but that was a miserable, stressful story. And that was the Atlas one that you sold, right? No, that, no, that was the HEK oh, and Tesco one. Yeah. So feature fills for families where I had ascended to the presidency of it after I, I had been gone for a number of years, but they blew itself up by with violations of the do not call list. And so it effectively shut them down in my 2017. Um, so this business, and I'm really proud of the work that I did there, but I sure as heck don't mention on my profile that, oh, subsequently the company was shut down by the FTC, uh, but it was. And when did you leave them? I left in 2007. Uh, oh, so that was a while. Yeah. I don't think there's any business that really pays attention to the yeah, you know, calls because I get <laughs> I keep getting calls from whoever and I even worked at call centers and like uh they, they said there's numbers on the do not on the national do not call list and they're like yeah that's just well Trump removed a lot of that yeah a few years ago and then I now I get more junk calls than contact calls true feature films distinguish themselves by by having over a hundred million violations of the do not call list which is effectively calling every single household in the United States. And I was asked to testify uh, on behalf oh, of the wow. FTC when that happened. So, um, and as I mentioned, so I went broke during this. From the H and K? Or from the, yes, because I have five and a half million dollars of personally guaranteed debt. And so I don't put that in there. So anyway, I guess I'll just sum up here. What appears to be just gilded and awesome, it, there's way more to, to the story with me and with everybody else. So when you have these experts show up here and you're just ask them, all right, come on, tell me, tell me more. Let's 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 peel the onion a little bit because there's always some layers underneath it. So how many has anybody seen the graduation speech? I think Steve Jobs gave this one, but many of other people, they get up there in front of a graduating class and they say, just follow your passion. As if that's the, that's the key to happiness and a successful life is just follow your passion. That's the hardest thing to find. <laughs> well, I think it's the worst advice ever given. Um, and it's always given by some super rich person, usually a billionaire. And so again, <laughs> take advice from billionaires with a grain of salt because they're coming from a place where they have lives that are in, they're not relatable to anybody other than a couple hundred people in the United States. You might be thinking, well, my gosh, Mike, why are you telling me that I shouldn't just follow your passion? And it is the just is an important part of that. I'm not saying don't follow your passions, but don't just follow your passion. Yes. I've noticed some of those, uh, some of those people that you listen to them and it just seems like they're really just disconnected now. And they started off like Bill Gates started off as some, some college student who, who he also, he also started off, um, in a very, very privileged family as well. Um, which those up from the bootstrap stories tend to tend to, uh, omit that stuff. So Scott Galloway has a great video. You can check this out and I'll, and I'll make sure that you've got this deck. Um, it's two minutes long. He just very pithily talks about why this is bad advice. But I would say the best advice is find out what you're really good at, but people will pay you for it. And then work your ass off. And what that will do is that will create the time and resources that you can pursue your passion. So I ski 100, my last year I skied 126 days. I think I'll get to 150 this year. But I went years where all I did was work 100 hours a week. I didn't go skiing. I never even thought about skiing. I put time in, worked really hard, and that created the time and flexibility for me to be able to pursue your passion. And this last one about the cap so capitalism rewards risk. 
we get like entrepreneurs get venerated all the time and they tend to talk a lot about the risks that they took as if risk in and of itself is a good thing. I would uh, contend that risk taking in and of itself is of no value um, because oh, it's cut off there. You can't see it, but anyway, I can remember my bullets. Do you care about, so who, who here has, looks like everybody has a cell phone. Probably are like half iPhones and half Androids. Do you guys care what risks Steve Jobs took? Are you paying for the risks that Steve Jobs took when he started Apple? No, you don't care. You care about the value that was created. So risk in and of itself is of no value. And back when I was a finance uh, professor, I used to drill into the students that value is actually cash flow divided by risk. So, and that's, it was coming at that in terms of shareholder value. But the reason that I'm bringing this up is because there's so much uh, press around taking risks, it can influence us to take dumb risks. Value, going out and creating value takes a lot of hard work and it doesn't necessarily have a guaranteed payoff, but what you get paid for is, is value, not taking risks. Okay, I mentioned that my dad had a history of giving me bad advice, particularly when it came to uh, pursuing higher education. But the best advice my dad ever gave me was this one, and that is have plenty of fuck you money. So I asked my dad when I started to make some money, what should I do? My dad's a financial planner, so I thought I should go to him. And he said, I'm your dad, so go talk to somebody else, but I'm gonna give you this piece of advice because it's important and you'll remember it. So since I didn't have any money at the time, how did it apply? The way that it applied is that I was starting to do really well in this company. I was getting promoted fast. I was getting raises all the time. And so the way that it applied was I didn't change my lifestyle as I made more money. And so the more money I made by keeping my lifestyle in check, uh, the more confident I could feel, the less stress that I would have felt because if I lose my job, so what? I don't have, you know, I don't have a big fancy lifestyle. I'm not gonna have to liquidate anything. And I accumulated assets. Otherwise, I accumulated some wealth at the time by keeping my lifestyle in check. And so I started to create that FU money. And once I had some, it empowered me to be able to, and it's not like I had a lot. I just had enough that I didn't have to worry about living expenses for, say, a year. It empowered me to become an entrepreneur, and I say at the craziest time, because I quit my awesome job at Feature Films for Families when I had just bought a house, and my wife was eight months pregnant with her first, uh, first child. And because I had kept my lifestyle in check as my income went up. I was able to do this with her support. And my, and what I did is I spent six months trying to find a business to buy. And that was my full-time work, was looking, searching for a business to buy. And if I hadn't listened to my dad's advice, I wouldn't have been able to do that. If I had some big, huge mortgage, a bunch of stupid cars, I would have sold my freedom for a bunch of, of material stuff that really isn't going to make, at least it wasn't going to make me happy. And as an entrepreneur, it helped me make good choices. So again, and, and I went through some periods where we, we made extraordinary amounts of money. And again, I never checked, I never just kept the lifestyle the same. And the good choices it helped me make is if I had a client that was doing unsavory business that, or unethical stuff, I could fire that client because I wasn't worried about like the $15,000 a month personal nut that I had to, to, to uh, cover. And when I went broke, it saved me from going personally bankrupt. Of all these things up here, that's probably the most important one because that would have been so painful with two little kids and a wife to have to you know, lose your house and, uh, and stuff like that. So I just, I lost a pile of money, but I was still fine. And after I went broke, it empowered me to do it again because I didn't want to, I actually didn't know if I was employable. I had I'd been self-employed at that point now for so long that, and I'd done it in a bunch of different places where I could call myself a serial entrepreneur. 
I contend is a euphemism for being unemployable. So, but anyway, I was empowered to do it again. And again, it was because my lifestyle was compared. And it's not like I live like a pot. I live a really nice life, but I kept it in check and this empowered me to go do it again. And when my relationship with my business partners, when we did it again, was sure, I had, so it connects to two business partners. Those, those two happen to be married. So we owned a third, a third, a third of the business. But when you got two married business partners, you tend to lose all votes. Uh, <laughs> so during COVID, this really exacerbated the stress. COVID was actually great for our business, but it, it exacerbated the stress. Uh, and I just didn't want to be working there anymore. So business was great. Work sucked. And I was able to just quit. And in this case, because one of my partners, I disliked her so much, I did say, um, I took, so I took this part literally and, and said it. Um, but this has provided me so much um, optionality um, and happiness. And as I considered options afterward, I was able to be totally picky. One of the options I had was I'm gonna just go ride my bike across the United States for a year. But anyway, when the when the right opportunity came, which was to be president of Atlas, I took it. Um, but it was considered. Did you have a question? Yeah, that relationship was with your wife or just a business partner. This is my business partner. Yeah, things are things are good with my wife. Mostly. And so I would say that optionality is one of my most valuable assets. So having the options and freedom to do what I want rather than be stuck somewhere. I just can't even conceive of what it would be like to just be stuck. So quickly, I'll go through Small Lake City because this is another important thing. So my network is right up there with optionality in terms of value. So I have a rich network of colleagues and friends, et cetera, and they've been instrumental in my professional success. So I view networking as a key part of managing my career and networking is not going to cocktail parties and networking events, just skip those. They're zero value. When I talk about networking, it's the working part, that's the big deal. So I'll lean into things like serving on a board, um, going to alumni functions, places where there's, where there's some kind of affinity and board membership, these, these have been, because when you work next to somebody, you start to develop relationships. So some of those, like I was the, uh, for the first Unitarian church up across the street from the U. Um, and that was great. So I got to meet people because I worked with them. And so if I need something, I can call them. But another thing is, is that I'm so reluctant to spend the social capital to ask somebody in my network for something that I make damn sure that this is really important. And I know that I can't come back to that well all that often. And I have formed businesses now with classmates, alumni, um, and colleagues that I've worked with in the past. But unfortunately, I've also burned bridges. And every time I've done that, it's come back to haunt. Like I burned one with one of my bankers because I was a total ass to him. And then I found myself five years later and I needed him to bank a deal and he wouldn't even talk to me. Like it was just off the table. And that's been, and in Small Lake City, we know everybody. And we're like one or two degrees of separation. So if, if you do something and blow up some relationship, I guarantee it'll come back to haunt you. I've also, and I work on paying things forward all the time with people. If somebody comes and asks me for help and they're in one of these, these networks of mine, I always say yes. And pretty much every one of those has come and paid me back too. So anyway, in this small town, you know you're gonna run into people again for, for good and for bad. So just anyway, take care of your network. And that's small AC. And again, Gail Miller threw me out of her house in 1988. And here I am. So see the network, Gail Miller. I could have burned that bridge. Fortunately, she's Did not you guys there. make up? I, I doubt she. Wait, was it her? Oh, was it her? Was her son your friend? Uh, Steve. Yeah, mm. Steve. Steve was a year ahead of me in high school. Oh wow. So just some real quick reflections, and sorry, we won't have a lot of time. There's no correct path to success. Um, there are so many pathways to end up in the same place. I went through a totally non-linear. It's not. A, it's not. What I went through is not a playbook that you give to some kid uh, to end up, but it worked. Your definitions of success may change, and that's, that's fine. They sure have for me. 
I used to be the most ambitious, the most uh, competitive guy you could find. I'm not now, and that's and that's I'm very okay with that. This too shall pass the highs and the lows. So when, th when things were really high for me, man, I hit peak hubris and it was a really high peak. And I thought we were gonna be amazing for forever. And we went through some real hard stuff. And I thought that hard time was gonna last forever and it didn't. So again, this too shall pass both the highs and the lows. And uh, you'll likely be really different than you are five years from now and 10 years from now. So. At least me, I have a tendency to think that the way things are right now is just the way they're going to be. And then when I look back five, every five years, I can look back and go, wow, I am so different from where I was. So if, you, if you're in a place right now where you're not particularly satisfied, that's going to pass. And that's it for me. So mm -hmm. I, um, What's a book you recommend? A book that I would recommend? Yeah. Oh, what, uh, on a particular topic or just a book that I like? Yeah, it's just a book that's helped you maybe the most. So, you know, my PhD is in the social sciences, so I tend to, so that's kind of a preoccupation of mine. I really think a lot about how people make decisions. So there's two books by a guy named Dan Kahneman. Uh, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics and, uh, 10, 12 years ago. One's called Thinking Fast and Slow, and the other is called Noise. Is it how to make decisions in the area? It explains how we make oh, decisions. Oh, it's just thinking fast and slow. Yep. Okay. What was the name of the other one? Noise. It's also about, it's, it's about how he defines noise in a very particular way, but how that um, interferes with good decision making. An example of that would be if I'm, I could interview the same candidate for a job in the morning um, versus at the end of the day and evaluate that person completely differently based on how, what my mood is, if I'm hungry or not, if I'm tired. So that's noise that affects decisions. It's really cool. It's just called noise? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So I have a question like related um, with Salt Lake. So like, have you ever thought like about like leaving Salt Lake and going to like, LA or like Miami or New York? I have not. And the reason being, so when I was, when I quit my job at Feature Films to look for a business, one of the criteria that I established was it had to be here. The reason it had to be here, there are a couple. I have family here. I have a lot of friends here. But more, most importantly, my lifestyle isn't working with anywhere else. I, I ski all the time. And I ride mountain bikes all the time. But I also work really hard, and my work yeah, pre-COVID caused me to travel all the time. With the international airport 10 minutes from downtown Salt Lake, like there's just there's nowhere else in the world that provide. And think about Salt Lake. Salt Lake, you can do just about anything you want for a living because the economy is so diverse. So if you're, <clears throat> it's really cool to be able to ski like a ski bum, but not be a ski bum. So um, I have never considered leaving. I think Salt Lake City is the greatest place that uh, at Higher, least- Like the license plate says? Yeah. Cool. That yes. maybe was a key for, for your success too, to stay here, right? Absolutely, yeah. And where did you sell the um, Atlas to? You said Nice? We sold it to, yeah. So Nice is a, so they're, a, uh, they're traded on the NASDAQ. They're a big customer experience. They have a huge operation in Sandy right by uh, Real Salt Lake. Oh, okay. Um, I used to speak delivery to them all the time. Yeah. It's so, called Nice. Okay. So they were nice in contact when they bought in contact. Now they're trying to bring everything into the nice, uh, nice name. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting that they're called Nice. They're an Israeli. They were it started in Israel, and the Israel the Israeli team. They're awesome. They're rick, wickedly smart. They work so hard, mm -hmm. but they are not nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Yeah, they're they're kind of intense. Okay, they're just trying to be, so they need themselves that. Uh, perhaps they yeah. want to be, but they're not. Yeah. But do you do you plan to be with them for a while? I don't know. So I'm um, I'm heavily incentivized to be there for three years from the time of the acquisition. So I'll definitely uh, fulfill that. Uh -huh. After that, I don't know. I've never worked for a big company before, so this is. Uh, uh -huh. 
So even though we're in, we're independent in go to market and but product, yeah. but but like legal and finance, that stuff's been taken. So now I'm having to deal with 15 levels of approvals and contracts taken forever. And I don't know if uh, I, I don't know if I'll want to keep doing that. So we'll see. But the nice thing is, is I've got the options after to then go <coughs> do some whatever. Yeah. So you still own the outlet. The outlets are like you said, and it's we don't know, we don't own it, they own it. Oh, they, that's they, but you're still doing the same thing yeah. with this small company. Still, that. still yeah. running, yeah, okay, still running it. the business. Yeah. Um, is it still named that or is it it's still yeah, name is the same, brand's the so same. You're just owned by yep. a different company. Yep. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that you didn't have a lot of liquid assets when you were shopping for your own company. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious how you can accomplish that for uh, great, great question. So and this gets a little bit technical. So one of the things that we were looking for was a business that was easy to finance. So a business that's easy to finance has specific types of assets. Like a software company doesn't have any physical assets that like a bank would want to use as collateral. The reason being, if you don't pay the bank back and they take your software company, they don't know how to run it, right? But H&K had a bunch of, it had equipment, it had a building, it had inventory and it had accounts receivable. So these are, accounts receivable is in a physical assets. It's people that owe you money. But all of these things, banks are, that's what they do. So um, you go to Zion's bank and you wanna get a business loan. Those are the things that they're gonna look at. And so we bought an asset heavy business. What sucks about an asset heavy business is you got a lot of cash tied up in it. So it's not gonna have the same type of return on equity that a software company does, right? Software companies are ridiculously profitable because they have so few physical assets and the gross margins are so big. So we had to make a particular kind of choice. The other things we were looking for, it had to have problems we knew how to fix. So if they didn't know how to weld, we couldn't help it. But what they were bad at was inventory management, which was cash flow. They were bad at getting uh, their getting, they were bad at collections. They paid their bills way too fast. And they also didn't, they didn't know sales and marketing. So my partner and I, we were able to come in there and change stuff up fast, but they had a great reputation. They built good stuff and they had a good brand. So it was a smart buy for us, but we had to be really particular. But what I did have is I could go for a year, maybe a year and a half and not require any income. So what we did is we, Troy and I picked specific jobs that we were going to do ourselves. So we, we, we fired a couple of the people there. We took over those positions and just didn't pay ourselves any salary. So we had the benefit of their salary as well to help uh, <clears throat> pay off the debt. that we did. So we did what's called a leverage buyout is we leveraged up the assets of the company and used the company's cash flow to pay back the debt. Thank you. I really appreciate that answer. Um, that sounds very similar to how people will sell you online. Um, yes. Yeah. Very, very similar. Yeah.